I'm Pat Dorsey, publisher of the Herald Tribune Media Group, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to the latest edition of the HD, HT Herald Tribune Hot Topics Forum. Tonight's uh, issue is on the Sarasota Bayfront. First, I want to thank the Van Weasel Performing Arts Hall and its staff for hosting tonight's event. Mary and Monica are here tonight joining us. Uh, New College of Florida, who's our standing partner for the series of forums that we do throughout the year. Our special co-sponsors for this event, uh, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and John Thaxton was a big help in uh, putting this all together, and Bayfront 2020. Our panelists for tonight's forum, which Tom will introduce here in a second, and of course the Herald Tribune staff, which works behind the scenes to make these events very successful. So we hold these forums to give our readers and the public an opportunity to learn more about important issues that impact our community. Tonight, our goal is to help advance a community-wide process for creating a vision for the beautiful Bayfront land that surrounds us. As usual, our moderator is Tom Tryon, the Herald Tribune's opinion editor. In January, Tom will begin his 34th year uh, with the Herald Tribune. He's a native, born in Palmetto, been around a long time. That's a good, good clap. And he's moderated these forums since 2011. So again, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Without further ado, let's get on with the program. Tom, it's your show. Great, thank you, Pat. All right, I know what everybody's thinking. He started at the Herald Tribune when he was 10. <laughs> 22, actually, right out of college. Uh, I credit the Herald Tribune for taking a very big risk <laughs> uh, on me. Um, what a great crowd. Um, with all due respect to New York City and Brooklyn, can you beat this? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nice park you got there. Real nice park, but it's not this. Um, thanks for the turnout. We appreciate everybody being patient uh, with us. It's great to have a full house. I know it might be a little tight, but uh, I think we'll be fine. Hopefully everybody can hear. Um, everybody will indulge me with uh, my transition into later middle age with having to use these to read. Um, but let me just quickly set the stage. Um, Candace Damon of HRNA Advisors will give a, a brief presentation, about 10, 15 minutes, um, and going over some of the principles and some of the things that she's heard so far. And then we will um, uh, segue into a nice portion of, um, of audience input, 35, 40 minutes. We will ask everybody to be tight with their comments so people can, so the most people can get their, uh, get their words in. And near the end, I'll ask Candace and Michael Clobber, our other guests, to respond and talk about next steps we will end promptly at 7 p.m. All right, here's the mute your cell phone reminder. <laughs> Thank you for the cue. So if everybody would do that. So let me just go ahead, we'll get started, we'll jump right in, and I'm going to introduce Candace P. Damon. She is Vice Chairman of HRNA. She spent more than 30 years endeavoring to craft, and I'm gonna quote, sustainable urban redevelopment strategies for cities across North America. She's focused on organizational planning for nonprofits and institutions and has worked to ensure long-term viability of urban open spaces. She has something in common with um, legions of people in Sarasota. She spent part of her working life working in real estate. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, she earned a BA from Amherst College and a law degree from this obscure law school known as Harvard Law. She lives with her husband, David, son, Otis, and two Jack Russells, Bruno and Wally, which I have heard over the telephone, in Brooklyn, <laughs> New York. Michael Clobber may need no introduction in this town, but he's co-proprietor of Michael's on East and Michael's Wine Cellar in Sarasota. Following studies at Cornell University, he worked at the famous Royal Sinesta in our Nose restaurant in New Orleans. Then he came back, or came to this area to run, uh, oversee the restaurant operations of his family's historic Colony Beach Resort on Longboat Key before striking out on his own in 1987, it's been a long time, to open Michael's on East in Sarasota. Some of you may have heard of that place. <laughs> He's a co-founder of Sarasota Manatee Originals. He and his wife Terry live in downtown Sarasota. Are you hosting an after party? Tonight? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and are involved in too many good causes to list. He's currently chairman of Visit Sarasota County. Let's welcome both of our guests, please. Okay, don't forget your mic instructions, Michael. Okay. Michael's going to give us a quick three to five minute um, opening statement, kind of reminding us uh, why we're, ha we're interested in a shared vision. 
how we got here. Well, this is really fantastic to see such a great crowd and uh, looks like standing room only there. I want to uh, take an opportunity to thank the Sarasota Herald Tribune for hosting this forum and to the Gulf Coast Community Foundation for their sponsorship. Sarasota's been my home for 45 years. I'm a Sarasota High graduate and a downtown resident for the past 12 years. I've had a city business for 28 years and counting. While on a learning trip with community leaders and public officials a year ago, the conversation arose about the upcoming potential sale of the Quay. That was a year ago. Still hasn't happened yet. <laughs> in addition, the Gee Whiz property had been returned to the city and the failed proscenium properties were in legal disarray. We realized with great surprise that no one was considering the bigger picture. Was anyone thinking about the impact of the development of the former proscenium properties in concert with the Van Wezel property, the Quay, and Gee Whiz? The answer was a big no. With the help of our city's Urban Design Center, we learned that the combined properties in play encompass over 75 acres. My brain was racing. When will we ever see multiple properties like this come into play in our lifetimes again? especially properties in the central core of the cultural arts district sitting directly on our bayfront. I thought about things like how can these properties connect our city and neighborhoods? How can we use this opportunity to create more access to our beautiful bayfront? As you know, some of the best views of the water are from your car parked in the Van Wezel lot. <laughs> and even better, those loading docks on the back as they're loading in and out shows, right Mary? We started a dialogue with the community and civic organizations about a common vision for the future of our community. We want to have city staff and elected officials hear a unified voice with regard to creating a new private-public partnership and to create a vision for our Sarasota Bayfront and Cultural Arts District. Our goal is to work collectively as a group and realize the future cultural, environmental, and economic potential of our vibrant community. A vision statement was created by a small group of the early starters to allow for broad community support and input. And it goes like this. We support the creation of a long-term master plan for the Sarasota Bayfront area that will establish a cultural and economic legacy for the region while ensuring open public access to the Bayfront. Very simple. And so we started. Virginia Haley of Visit Sarasota County and I began meeting with a wide variety of community organizations and asked their boards to adopt the vision. We decided to call this initiative Sarasota Bayfront 20. First of all, because we hope that by the year 2020 we see significant results. And secondly, the ocular or the 20 colon 20, because it's going to take real focused vision to be able to see this through. From the Chamber, to the EDC, to MOAT, to the Arts Alliance, to the 26 neighborhoods, actually 30 neighborhoods of the Coalition of City Neighborhoods, we now have the support of 21 organizations and counting. Next, July, or, uh, next in July, the Sarasota City Commission unanimously blessed Sarasota Bayfront 2020's plans. The Commission asked us to report back to them in a workshop format in early January. Our goal will be to have a clear picture of our community's vision and a preliminary roadmap for Bayfront redevelopment, cultural park plan implementation strategies, and financial planning, of course. So here's where we are now. 21 arts, neighborhood, foundation, and business groups have had their boards unanimously vote to support a common vision statement. These community organizations, board members alone, encompass literally hundreds of informed Sarasota residents. More organizations are expect us to join us soon. We haven't stopped yet. The level of commitment and support so far for the development of this common vision and partnership with the city is unprecedented in at least the last 30 years. In October, we entered the broad-based outreach phase of the project. We launched the Sarasota Bayfront 2020 website, the Twitter and Facebook pages, and it's, and it's only its first week, the Facebook page received over 1,000 likes and is now over 1,500 and counting. We had a tremendous turnout for our first two community forums held in October and fantastic feedback from the community. At your seat, you will find information about how to continue to connect to this conversation online, and we hope you'll use it. 
We have no preconceived ideas, only a quest to figure out what our community truly desires. We bring this conversation to all of you, as we have with others in our community, in the interest of collaboration and openness. Our key objective right now is to create a crystallized set of core values and common goals to be able to use as a guidepost for our community and public officials for the foreseeable future, a guidepost to hold on to. Please remember, and I want to stress this, that at this phase of the process, we are strictly looking at the Bayfront from the 10,000-foot view. There are two exciting parallel processes occurring right now that we need to keep in mind. The Van Wezel, the Sarasota Orchestra, the Sarasota Ballet, Moat Marine, and others are all involved in their own processes of assessing their future needs. At the same time, our community is involved in this comprehensive analysis. I believe that as both processes complete, it will but be much easier to take the next steps towards an educated future redevelopment of our Bayfront. Makes sense to me. You know, I've watched many great visions for parts of our city come and go over my last 45 years here. As I said earlier, we will never see this type of opportunity again in our lifetimes. We have the chance now to help create a vision that will benefit future generations for decades to come. The heart of the Sarasota region is in our central core of arts and culture. We can't lose that. We need to make sure it has a chance to prosper and grow. I believe that without it, we could falter. I'm proud to be part of our community. I'm interested in seeing our city prosper. I want this to be a place where my children and grandchildren want to live and be a part of. And I'll leave you with a thought that I've said several times. Almost 100 years ago, John Ringling had a vision for a cultural institution on the Sarasota Bayfront in what is now the Ringling Campus. 100 years later, it's our turn. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, we are going to uh, turn it over to Candace who's gonna tell us a little bit about what she's heard so far, how the process has gone, and I think uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the guiding principles and maybe how they've been tweaked a tad. So uh, Candace, it's yours. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, in part because these kinds of community-driven uh, civic activist efforts to plan for communities are absolutely our favorites. Um, they end up resulting in the best projects in the country. Uh, we can talk about some of the examples of that, but I think it's, um, it's an amazing beginning to look out at 300 people and, uh, and to begin to start thinking about how we can realize your vision for this waterfront. It's also a great pleasure because it's a chance for me to work with one of my absolute favorite colleagues, Alex Stokes, who is a native Sarasotan, and will be working the slides for me tonight. Alex uh, was, as a much younger man, involved in virtually every youth troop that you could be associated with the cultural organizations on this uh, piece of land. So it's an important project for him too. So uh, in the several meetings that we've had so far, one of the first questions that comes up is, so what land are you actually talking about? There are close to 75 acres of land that a community-based planning process could concern itself with. The core are the 42 acres that many of you have seen us show in previous presentations that is a city-owned, city-managed piece of land on which the cultural institutions where we sit and their neighbors are located. Immediately adjacent to it are the 11 acres of Centennial Park, city-owned and county-managed, which makes this a bit over 50 acres, and then there are two private parcels uh, adjacent. Um, those of you who have heard me talk before have heard me say that I am skeptical about planning for other people's land, but when you plan for your own land well, and it comes out well, you influence how they think about the development of their land. So we have 40 to 50 something acres of public land, your land, to think about how it can achieve the vision that you have for the city of Sarasota, and how that can uh, influence and create a foundation for better development of the private land immediately adjacent to it. 
Um, Michael indicated that there is a large and growing number of, collabor of uh, uh, community groups that have come together to form Bayfront 2020. Since the last time I was here at the end of October, the list has gotten five organizations longer. Um, hopefully, that many of you belong to organizations that will also join this coalition, which represents really the best of how American cities are thinking about uh, planning for their cities uh, in the future. Now, the aim, ultimately, is to, to move from this discussion of principles and vision that we are having tonight and will have probably continue to have in the, in the weeks up to a January meeting with the City Commission to a phase where we begin to think about master planning for the site and then design construction and build out of the ideas that, that you surface. Master planning of this site is, of course, not a new idea. Um, this site was originally master planned 50 years ago by the extraordinary collaboration of design talent known as Taliesin. And the Taliesin group, when they put together the master plan for this site, uh, built out its first phase uh, shortly thereafter, which is more or less what you see today. They observed that great master plans are flexible and they accommodate people's changing ideas about how they want to live, about changing economics and changing demographics. They provide a framework in which to work and achieve a vision over a period of time. Uh, and I would argue that their master plan has functioned reasonably well, and it is time to now revisit it. In fact, they speculated on what a third phase some number, some number of decades after they began might look like. Unsurprisingly, they were very wrong because technology has evolved in different ways and this community has grown in different ways, but they gave you the framework within which con to continue to think about what this site can be. And indeed, through the last decade or so, you have begun to revisit the notion of master planning. Uh, first in 2001 with the Duane downtown plan, more recently with the 2007 plan for this site itself which was led by a firm out of New York, Cooper Robertson, and today here we are revisiting those efforts, thinking about what went wrong and how you're gonna get it right this time. Now, the 2007 plan, I think Alex and I have come to believe, in fact enjoyed fairly significant support from this community. Um, the recession, as much as anything, is the reason that its ideas were not implemented. And one of the very excellent things that the 2007 plan did was advance a set of design principles. Seven ideas for what um, a built-out master plan for this land might look like, with the emphasis on look. And I think pretty much everybody that we've shown these principles to has said there's little to object to there. Um, those seven principles represent some combination of well, of course, and really good ideas. What they don't do, though, is anticipate uh, the major changes that have occurred in this area, with the most important being the Great Recession, but a variety of other public policy initiatives as well that have occurred since 2007. So I think it is no longer possible to simply blow the dust off the 2007 plan and implement it. Significant things have changed. Um, again, the recession, but also the potential of the adjacent properties, the excitement about them, and then the disappointment about their uh, failure to redevelop, the um, failure of G Wiz, and the fact that uh, state DOT is thinking about very different treatments of 41 than was the case in 2007. Equally importantly, I think, is the fact that those design principles are less useful for helping you think about tough decisions about implementation as you move forward. Because they describe only what the land should look like when it's built out and not how you choose between competing objectives and how you decide which, which elements to fund ahead of others, there are a set of what we've been calling implementation principles that we think that you should consider, debate, and then adopt as a community, and that's gonna be the focus of the question and answer period to follow. Um, why do I think principles are important? Um, because they permit a civic organization, a civic movement, to talk to each other in an informed and civil way over the course of several political administrations because great land like this is gonna take more than one um, council term or mayoral term to advance. 
and you're going to want to be able to continue to advocate for the set of principles that you established over a period of time and principles that are explicitly geared towards helping you make decisions allow you to return to these core, core values that underpin what it is that you are trying to do. So the, the background to this slide is a cartoon of the principles that were adopted by, in fact, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation, the very fine park that my son is growing up in in Brooklyn, um, and had allowed the very fractious uh, Brownstone Brooklyn community to begin to have conversations about, well, if this park is gonna be financially sustainable and if we're gonna use real estate to pay for it, how much real estate of what kind, at what point is it not a park and is it in fact a real estate development and, and to structure those conversations in a way that permitted civil and productive discourse over what has turned out to be 20 years but we're almost done building it and it's pretty great. So we came here at the end of October and we proposed six principles and they were grounded in our early conversations with you our consideration of the site, our close reading of the 2007 plan. And they're sort of summarized in those six boxes at the top of the slide. So we said something about your aspirations, we said something about how important the cultural institutions that are here now are and how important the cultural institutions are to the economy of the city. We said something about the importance of that great bayfront. We said something about how important it was to activate this place so that it's not just a giant service parking lot. Uh, we talked about connectivity because so many of you had told us how isolated this site is and we proposed a principle about both financial and environmental sustainability. Um, and then we presented those short statements to 250 of your neighbors at two different public meetings, many of you were there. And we got pages and pages of comments, 175 pages I'm told, Alex read every one of them. And uh, we've tried to reflect what we heard in a modification of that first draft that we brought. Um, and in a very short few minutes, I'm gonna show you where we are with our drafting and you're gonna start telling us how close we were. But generally, what we heard with respect to your aspirations for this site is that there is substantial consensus that this land has the potential to be the iconic piece of land, the view, the brand, the heart, the soul of this community. Um, and that there are universally high aspirations for this piece of land. There, we haven't met a person who said, it's just not that important, there are other pieces of land that are more important. Um, I think there's an agreement that redevelopment, appropriate redevelopment of this site could be transformative to the region and could establish the look and feel of this place for the next hundred years. So, moving on to the importance of the cultural heritage of this site, I think there's an agreement that the existing cultural institutions have to be prioritized and a stable foundation for their continued health and growth created. Um, but that there is an opportunity to introduce new cultural elements here, new institutions and new offerings, particularly that celebrate the history and the socioeconomic uh, age and various other kinds of diversity of this community in a, a site that is activated both inside buildings as it is today, but also outside. Um, I think there is absolute consensus that the natural assets of the site are underutilized now and that has to be redressed. That some significant gesture to creating great public open space needs to be part of the thinking about redevelopment of the site and we also need to preserve the views into the site uh, for those who aren't actually here. Uh, most of you felt that uh, improving connectivity to and to the site and from the site uh, to the bayfront north and south and to the east of downtown was the prerequisite for everything else. That if you didn't fix connectivity, if you didn't um, straightforwardly acknowledge that this site is hard to get to, uh, that the rest of the vision was gonna be very hard to achieve and people had a host of ideas and advocated virtually every mode of transportation as a means of making the site more connected. So interest in water taxis and other kinds of water transit and pedestrian and bicycle and automobiles. 
Finally, no, not finally, we're on activation. Um, I, it comes as no surprise that everybody said the site could be much more active and should be much more active, and that is that achieving that is going to be principally a function of ensuring that there are things to do here, not just in the fall, winter, spring months, but also in the summer, not just at night, but also in the day, um, and that there are a range of different kinds of activities that appeal to a range of different kinds of people. And then finally, we talked about sustainability, which in most of the groups who focused on that issue with whom we met, there was a sense that sustainability as a principle is kind of the deal breaker. That if we're not going to plan for a site that can withstand climate change, um, that is resilient to storm surge, and that <clears throat> builds economic strength for the city and is financially self-sustainable, then we're not gonna rebuild the site. And that's just a prerequisite. So we can talk about connectivity and activation all day long. If you can't figure out the numbers and you can't figure out the climate, we're not doing it. I think that was the sense of most of the people that we talked to. And then there were a lot of interesting conversations about how exactly sustainability is achieved. So that's what we heard. That's 175 pages summarized really, really quickly. Um, so what we're going to do next, I think, is have a very short conversation among us and then open it up to conversation about the second draft of the principles, which I will put up and show you and invite questions and comments in uh, about five minutes. Thank you, Candace. And that's your water? Yeah. Great. So just a couple quick questions maybe to set the stage. And Candace, um, you can strap your mic back on. Um, you know, and I'll ask Michael first. Um, I'm sure you've heard this from people. Um, yeah, plans are a dime a dozen. We've been through visioning. You know, you're a businessman. Why don't you just get something, you know, let's just get something done. How do you respond to people when they say that? Well, for me, it is about listening. It's about creating a great listening for the community in order to be able to develop and crystallize those core values and guiding principles. And I am stuck on that because I truly believe that if we get that done, if we're able to, to solidify those, that the decisions that we make going forward, when we find out what the needs of our arts organizations and different stakeholder organizations on this property are, that those, are, those decisions that we make about how to redevelop the property are gonna be much more educated and much easier to digest. Okay, thanks. Candace, could you give us maybe one practical example um, that you've experienced where having these principles saved the day, in, us, in essence, where it, really, or where, where it really made a difference to keeping the community on track? I think Brooklyn Bridge Park is probably the best example, but um, I think I'd argue that, that Virtually without exception, the great investments in public open space, in cultural facilities, in civic infrastructure that have been made in this country in the last generation are the result of citizen activism. And they have always started with agreement about what the core values were, what the, the objectives were, and how you would know that you would succeed at the end of the day. Okay. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about you know, what happens when, and we don't have to get into the details, but what happens when somebody comes up with an idea for part of the land and discussions? How do you, or how do you recommend that communities deal with when you have institutions that may be waiting in the wings and want to move, need to move maybe? How do you recommend dealing with those kinds of challenges and pressures? I think the most interesting word in the mission statement that Michael read that Bayfront 2020 adopted when they started this is legacy. Um, and as we've talked about what a legacy means, I, I, the, the group of organizations that have come together to be Bayfront 2020 have started to hang on to the notion of this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to frame what this site can be for the next 100 years. And in the context of 100 years, and I, today's idea um, you know, you have time, you have time. You may miss this, you may in fact miss this real estate cycle, but, they're, but waiting for the community to spend what's likely to be not more than a year 
to think through what its core values are, how it can guide a design team and put together a master plan, seems to me that although one always runs the risk of making the perfect the enemy of the good, um, that you can wait. Now that said, some extraordinary opportunity may come along and you should leave yourselves open to consider it but it should be extraordinary. Okay, thank you, yeah, that's good. Um, so, you know, one of the things we all hear, um, geez, you really can't design anything by committee. I mean, it's a kind of a frequent phrase. Um, when you hear that, when that pops up, what do you say? Well, I, I agree. You, I don't think you can design by committee. This isn't a design process, though. This is, um, I was saying to some of uh, the, Bayfront 2020 people today, many of us have had the experience of um, having to deal with an IT project with which we had nothing to do. And the IT guys came in and they said, here's your new software and it doesn't work and it doesn't achieve what it's supposed to do for your business. Because you as a user were never consulted about what you wanted. Um, my husband and I are now in the process of thinking through an expansion of our house. Um, I have no intention of hiring five architects and letting them work as a committee, but if I don't tell the architect that there's a little boy and two dogs and you know, we're thinking about making some transitions in our life, then I'm not gonna get the design I want. So this isn't a design process. Okay, okay. This is not a committee that's designing it. It's a committee that's telling their designer what they want. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I don't think I've heard that yet. Um, that's good. So um, as we segue into um, audience input, this is a leading question, but tell me, um, from your professional perspective, what types of comments, other than short and sweet, really get to you, really make you say, huh, you know, that, or give you the aha moment, or convey something really important to you? Here, sure. specifically, yeah. or in general? Yeah, in general, just what, what you know, what, what, what makes you think, yeah, that's, I need to make a note about this comment. Good question. Um, Short and sweet is good, because we're <laughs> leading into that part. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I have the great good fortune to work with communities all across the country on questions like this. Um, and you can have a tendency to say, it's a beautiful waterfront, there's a surface parking lot. And not, I hope that, I hope I am always listening very hard to the unique conditions of particular places, but after a while it becomes there's a waterfront, there's a parking lot. And when you meet people who um, open your eyes to you know, a particular fantastic thing. Um, Alex and I were walking uh, from the garden club to here and it was the first time I'd walked over the boardwalk to here. And this astonishing treatment of this little tiny piece of the site that for the first time you could see the potential of what an authentic um, Floridian open space this might be. Um, that's really special, that touches you. Perfect, all right, so there's your challenge. We'll let you uh, unhook your microphone again. I think you're gonna lead this discussion from the podium. And I believe um, you're going to ask people to um, make their comment or pose a question and you'll repeat it back to them. Is that how we wanna do it? Yeah. Okay, and are you going to call on folks? You want them to raise their hand, or how would you like to do that? Uh, I'm going to ask for Virginia to identify the people who are going to speak. I don't think it's going to work to call them to the mic, because then we're going to move to the next question, and we'll have to send people back, and it will be confusing and annoying, especially if you were standing in line. So we'll be flexible. Um, Throw it or something, you know, talk. So what we're going to do is put up on this, oops, there's all of you. Um, on this screen, uh, all right, so we'll go through this first. So first, let's review. This is the foundation. This is the vision statement that Bayfront 2020 adopted when they first invited us down here. Uh, and it reads, we support the creation of an articulated vision, that's where we are today, and a long-term master plan, which is where we hope you get, for the Sarasota Bayfront area that will establish a cultural and economic legacy, there's that legacy word, for the region while ensuring open public access to the Bayfront. So if this is the vision which Bayfront 2020 subscribed to and I think succinctly is a, is a great elevator pitch, then principles that implement it must follow from that. So you saw a version of this before. Uh, some of you have started to ask about what's the process after this. 
The idea is that we get clear on the vision, we debate the implementation principles, which I'm about to show you, and that allows us to go prepare ourselves for a master planning effort and then for implementation of the vision. So the implementation principles. On that screen um, is the draft implementation principle. We're gonna go through six of them. On this screen are some questions designed to stimulate conversation. You don't have to answer those questions and I'm gonna restate them for all of those over there who can't see them. Um, and all of you should have the principle, all of the principles, all six of the principles on a piece of paper in your hand at the same time. So the notion is that we're gonna spend about 40 minutes talking about these principles, principle by principle, which means that a lot of you are not gonna to get to talk, but you have the comment cards, and Alex and I and some of the rest of us will be delighted to stay afterwards. Um, but this is a chance to begin to have a conversation all together about Alex's and my second draft of implementation principles. So we get, begin with this principle that talks to the aspirations for the site and the notion that it should be iconic and stand for this place for the next 100 years. And to get you to start talking, the questions that we thought might be interesting, again, if you have your own questions or, or comments to make, happy to hear them too. Questions that we thought might be interesting to talk to are, what does it mean to be an icon on the Sarasota Bayfront? What does that mean? If we say iconic, um, you know, the Eiffel Tower is an authentic and memorable icon in Paris, clearly inappropriate for this Bayfront. What would be, what would feel authentic and iconic here? So that's a question. Um, second question, if we say we want the Bayfront and the cultural campus and the open space that we create to be accessible and open to all, to feel welcoming to all, how are we gonna signal that? How does the design and the build out say to all the diversity of ages and socioeconomic conditions and all the different ways of categorizing people in Sarasota that you're all here? Is part of the answer that the site has to continue to be publicly owned? Does it have to be publicly managed? Are there price limits? Is there a certain, you know, a kind of activity here that would be too expensive that would start to signal that it wasn't meeting your aspirations for a publicly accessible, welcoming, opening place? So we're gonna have a set of, sli of slides like this for each of the principles, and we're gonna talk about each of the principles for about seven minutes each, and I have a timekeeper who's gonna keep us honest and uh, when we get to six minutes, I'm gonna say, that's the last question, next principle. Start. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the comment was it should be publicly owned, so we ensure that it really is accessible to all, but that does not necessarily mean that it should be publicly managed. I'm going to try and repeat. Yes? Uh, I didn't see the word recreation, and for a lot of people, it's a recreational spot, which is what most parks are for. So I was just wondering why the word recreation was left out. The question was, why is the word recreation not in this principle? Uh, and I would answer two things. Um, because I can always use a good editor, and we're still working on it, and because it is in other principles. So when you get through all six of them, tell me if you still think recreation belongs in the first one. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'd like to add to that, I'd like to see it be a fun place. I want to see it be a great garden for two years. The short version was there should be a major focus on fun 
And the word fun needs to appear in one of these principles. I will say in my defense, it was in the first draft and I got edited out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did all of you guys hear her? Okay, I'll repeat if I think it can't be heard. Yes, in the, yes. If uh, you guys will permit me to, well, for a follow-up, um, which structures would you define as historic? Uh, the auditorium, the art center, the Chisby Library, the Garden Club, and also the Bellhaven Building. So the comment, I, I, you probably all heard, but the comment was, you should make every effort to preserve the historic structures that are here today, which are most of the structures. Um, yes, in the blue. Yes. I, I, I want the conversation to be as wide-ranging as it's um, useful and fun for you guys to have. Uh, I think that kind of comment um, will work best and we'll have a terrific conversation when we talk about the cultural heritage and the cultural importance. Uh, yes, in front and then in back. Uh, sure, I think you're easier to hear then. I, I think one thing that is very important is that we never give away our, our control, that is the public ownership control of the properties. There are some Bayfront properties where the owners are tax free and there's been a lot of debate on that. And they just simply don't pay taxes by old agreements. And that is a shameful uh, situation that needs not to ever occur again. We need to make sure that the public ownership and we have our control we can lease, we can lease properties, we can, but the agreements need to be such that they can be broken so that they, so that the public is in the public's best interest at all times. The comment, did everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay, the comment was the land has to remain in public ownership and any leasing or licensing of it should be of short enough duration and with terms that make sure that the public's always in control. This is public land, and it ought to be treated that way. Yes? I can't think of a better iconic uh, place along the water than my hometown, Chicago, Illinois. And it's great for us because it stood the test of time for over 100 years. It incorporates recreation to the public of every kind. It's absolutely gorgeous. It can change it. There's now Centennial Park that has it. It's just been an astounding success. There is no more famous master plan than the master plan for the Chicago waterfront. Um, uh, uh, all right, there, and then, okay. Uh, you're gonna be the last question. You're gonna be, you're on, and you're gonna be the last question.
experience like they had in Chicago combined with beautiful parks and uh, where people have open space and can walk along and enjoy and skate, et cetera, et cetera. The comment was the land, it's the water, and the water views that are really spectacular. <laughs> so let's think about how to maximize those wa the water, the water views, the celebration of the ecology, and maybe an aquarium. Next principle. OK, so this is the principle that speaks to the cultural heritage of the site, um, and which talks about the need to create a long-term sustainable structure for the, thank you, Alex for those institutions um, that notes that they anchor in many ways the region's economy uh, and that the chance to, to celebrate Sarasota's diverse legacy by bringing new or encouraging the existing cultural institutions to tap into that is all to the good. So again, there are many questions. I think clearly there's some interest in beginning to talk about potential new cultural uses on the site. Um, the question that, that we thought might be interesting for those of you who don't have a, uh, a comet burning at the fore um, is the notion that, as Michael said in his introduction, each and every one of the cultural institutions that's here now is thinking very, very hard right now about how to position themselves for long-term sustainability. As they do so, do you have advice or do you want to talk to them about how they ought to think about bringing new food and beverage options here, uh, partnering with new cultural institutions, uh, creating new cultural programs and facilities on the site. Um, how would you like to talk to them about provision of parking on-site versus off-site, taking into account that each and every one of these institutions needs parking to create programming and to service their customers, um, but at the same time that we would prefer to see less service parking. And do you have advice or thoughts about how we can see a greater activated during the daytime piece of land using the cultural institutions to drive that activation? Um, let me start yeah, this, with this. Let's take a sexy license. Thank you. You're right. Blue shirt. One of the most successful events in New York City have been open concerts. A microphone. <laughs> it's intimidating. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was saying before, one of the most successful events in New York City have been open concerts in, in Central Park and other places that are free. And they attracted a lot of people that couldn't normally afford to go to a ballet or an opera or anything else and, and get to hear it and experience it and perhaps develop a lifelong interest uh, in, in that event. And I would love to see something like that here. Uh, you need a large open space to do it, but this is large. <laughs> Did you guys hear over there? OK. Question in this section, uh, in the uh, well, in the back. And become more of a universal. The question, or the, and the comment, I think, was that each and every one of these cultural institutions has really fine award-winning programs for youth, like the ones Alex was involved in. Um, why not create this? Build the brand of this place as a center for youth cultural education, so youth from all over the world would come here as a destination. Uh, I'm going to try somebody new first. Yes. Hi, Catherine Kelly, 56-year resident of Sarasota. Um, I believe the band shell um, uh, idea was incorporated into to the 2007 uh, idea of the Bayfront reconstruction. Um, also, the only thing that I haven't heard tonight as the presentation is um, the issue on the air rights. And if somebody would address that, I'd appreciate it. Could you clarify the issue on the air rights? Oh, the view corridor. Yes. Um, there are, well, I think there are view corridor restrictions in place that are going to make going above a certain height on much of the site difficult um, that have to do with the residential development adjacent to the site. Then there's also a desire, and we're going to get to this question actually in a few slides, 
there's a desire that doesn't ha particularly have to do with regulation to preserve particular corridors and to make view corridors a part of the design of the site as a whole and how facilities are located and how open space is developed. But I think probably the more germane, probably what you're asking is that there are in place restriction, height restrictions, um, which I will tee up as a question in a couple slides. So now we're over there. Hi, thank you. I can hold this? Okay. All right. Uh, this is probably a good place to just raise a point that kind of strikes me about these six, and that is that they seem very utilitarian to me. Um, you know, what seems to be missing, someone mentioned, let's have fun. What seems to be missing to me, and maybe this is the place where it could be inserted, is this idea of social capital, which I won't get into right now in any detail, but how do you build a place that people can act, where the community can invest in people being better with themselves? Um, cultural heritage just rings the wrong way to me. It sounds like we're gonna invest in something that's kind of taken from the past, make sure they're still here 50 years from now, as opposed to cultural investment, which may build on the shoulders of the institutions, but be thinking forward about how will this place strike people like that small little path struck you today. That will just bring people together because they want to be here, not because they're attending an event, not because there happens to be a restaurant that they're going to go to for dinner. But it's a place where people can be much like Central Park in New York. People go to Central Park not because there's a place to be there, it's simply because it's a place to be with other people. And how do you think about this as a place to be with other people to enjoy these great views, to enjoy a great show, to enjoy a great lunch or breakfast? Uh, I think that's part of what the evolution of the cultural identity of Sarasota could be with a place like this as well. Great. Yes, ma'am. And I want to, we lost G Wiz, okay, so that was one of my concerns, was again uh, bringing the community together and encouraging both seniors and children to be together. So one of the things that I would suggest is that we find some ways um, to, like the planetarium that they have. Now I know we've set an aquarium, but, but things like that, and I, could, I would go even further. I've seen some areas in Washington, D.C. where they bring pottery out and let people go ahead and work with pottery. I've seen where they've done some art classes, but they have them in the park, and they set them up for a period of time, and they bring the children and the adults to learn together. I think that's important. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to get new people, but okay. <laughs> a professional component, and also to establish an arts incubator. We have different incubators happening in this town. I've yet to hear about an arts incubator, and I think that's very important. The comment was that if you're serious about cultural diversity, there are a set of very specific metrics that ought to be applied um, to the retail program, to the, to the actual cultural programming, and a variety of others. I could take one more question on culture, and then we're going to move on. And I think I'm supposed to be in this section, right? This one over there. Hmm? All right, fine. <laughs> Hi. Um, mine's about parking. And I think we really can't afford not to have vaulted parking. I know that will be expensive, but it will maximize the actual land that's Bayfront land. So that's mine. Okay, let's move on to the Bayfront. Now this is the principle that used to say fun in it. Um, now it says welcoming, attractive, publicly accessible, safe and family friendly, uh, open space and view corridors, develop and preserve for future generations. So to get you started, um, is there a balance of recreation and relaxation that you're thinking about? Certainly in most of the open spaces that, that we've helped communities think about across the country, the balance of active and passive recreation and what kind of active recreation becomes one of the most hotly debated topics. 
Um, and then there's this question of the view corridors that uh, the woman over here teed up a moment ago. We have, first of all, the height restrictions, which are, as I understand them, um, pretty much a given and, and going to be hard to um, will away. And that, but then there is, in addition to that, I think an interesting question about view corridors for whom. Um, so if a car is driving by, should it have an unobstructed view of the bayfront? Or is it that if you're walking on the site, you should not have buildings in the way of the bayfront and therefore whatever public open space is developed ought to be developed on the, along the waterfront? Or is there some other meaning to view corridors um, that's worth talking about? So those are the two questions we thought up. Again, anything that you'd like to talk about that relates to this principle, including saying that it's prosaically drafted or missing words is all fair game. Yes, ma'am. What if you need that land for a parking garage and you have a private owner who decides to put up a Chinese restaurant? How do you maintain um, the interest of the people who own that land privately for as long as you need, how many months, how many years, that they don't do anything that will interfere with what you're trying to do here? Um, the question was, if there was potential to do off, I think, um, if there, if the way to maximize the views and to create great open space is to move as much parking as you can off site. So to acknowledge that we need parking to access the site and to help the cultural institutions, but we could do it on the immediately adjacent parcels as part of some larger private development. But meanwhile, um, a landowner that's not confident that this process is going to come to anything develops the private parcel in a manner that wouldn't permit that kind of value. I think the, the example was a Chinese restaurant. Um, what do you do? I mean, how, how can you really have any control over private developers on adjacent parcels who you want to cooperate? And I, I think the answer to the question, I'm not sure how satisfying you're going to find it, is. Um, is that the quality of the civic engagement and the, the respect and response of elected leadership to this civic engagement process will have an enormous impact on the response of the development community. That private developers in general are looking to maximize their return. Um, so nobody will build a standalone Chinese restaurant unless they think that's the highest value thing that can be created on that land. If there is a sense that this process has real traction, um, that the community is behind it, and that it, like other great open spaces and cultural campuses across the country, can create value, nobody will build the Chinese restaurant. They build the Chinese restaurant because they don't believe in this process. Ninety-five percent is filled land of uh, questionable province. So um, it's an opportunity, but w you know we have to recognize that to start with. That that what we've really talked about so far in terms of assets is the view, and we're basically starting with a blank slate in terms of the other natural assets. A fair point. Uh, can we get somebody f new first, and then it's yours. Uh, it's yours. Thank you for a second round. Um, I think one of the really fun things to do in Sarasota on the Bayfront is to come to the wonderful concerts that I believe the county, or I, may, I think the city may put it on. And you can sit, actually, um, there's a portable bandstand there. And you can sit outside the bandstand and still view the beautiful bay. In fact, I saw a big church come across the water one day, and I thought it was marvelous. 
It was, uh, it was a, it is an ongoing experience. So things that we do like build a band shell, which I think we definitely need. We need a free open band shell. So Sarasota is the arts capital of Florida, period. And we need to support our art, our art image. And we collect not only the fine arts, but the performing arts. And all of this needs to be uh, also so that we can have this beautiful bay view. So I think that principle included will keep the architectural design from covering up the bay view, if you will, with a band shell. Uh -huh. uh, red sweater. I promised I'd move back and forth. Okay. <laughs> she asked for it. One of the things that attracted me to Sarasota 26 years ago um, was um, coming down and going along US 41 in front of Marina Jacks and the bayfront there with all the boats and what have you moored out there and then going across the Ringling Bridge. So I think that in the question of uh, whose view, uh, I think it needs to be all of it. One of the things that distresses me is when they build high rise buildings in front of the bayfront and I drive down 41 and I can't see the bay anymore. When people come to visit me, I take them, I live in, in Southgate, in, Sar in the city of Sarasota, and I come US 41, Mound Street, right in front of Marina Jacks, and everybody goes ooh ah at the art, and the boats, and the bayfront, and I take them across John Ringling Bridge, and they go ooh ah again, and you carry that on up US 41, um, and it's just, it's just more of the same, and it's, 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 just, it's just the attraction the physical, visual attraction of Sarasota. One last. Uh... As I see the use of the Bayfront Park, I'm always taken with the fact that it seems like people are using it as, as their front yard or as their backyard. And I think as we have more condos and more apartments and more cement, fewer people will have those yards. And it will be very attractive and also good for social capital. I think, to make it a family-friendly front yard. Thank you. Um, the next principle has to do with activation and talks about the need for both uh, in-water and on-land recreational programming, outdoor cultural programming, uh, urban amenities shade, people were reminded me, we're in the south, uh, shade lighting in order to do 24-7 or at any rate 18-7 programming, alternatives to surface parking um, that support active usage of the bayfront throughout the day and in all the seasons. So to tee up the conversation, um, we're interested in talking to you about what amenities. One of the things that um, Tom has encouraged me to talk about what I've learned and what struck me since I've been here is that the last time we were here, there was a real interest um, in having a variety of retail options on the site, complementing the cultural and the open space. That the no <laughs> interesting, interesting, fascinating. But we so when we were here at the end of October, people <laughs> talked. Well, let's talk about what retail means. Would you want to have a glass of wine on the waterfront? That's retail. <laughs> Sandwich. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Good. So now we got a good conversation going. So what amenities? Um, are there amenities that are clearly yeah, inappropriate that you would not want here? And does activation require additional occupants in additional buildings or, as with the trucks, can we create a plan that is about strengthening the current cultural anchors and then the rest of it is maybe not the rest of it, but for the sake of this conversation, the rest of it is great open space that's programmed. Do we need more buildings or is it park and programming? Do we have to build cafes or can we do it all with trucks? What amenities? How do we activate? Um, and how do we know we've gone too far and it's not what we wanted anymore? Let me start way in the back. advantage of the water. I'm proposing 
which I wouldn't have done 10 to 15 years ago, but now I think it's time for water taxis in Sarasota to get us from one of these cultural events to another, from restaurant to restaurant, from restaurant to the Van Wezel. I mean, there's so many different things on the water, and it would be so much more fun, especially for tourists, to get there by water. Yes. <laughs> I'd like you to put fun back in your previous um, frame. And in this frame, whatever amenities that you do choose, I want them all to be fun and to be free and something that families can enjoy. No, I'm not done. Okay. <laughs> that, that being said, what, what will drive this? is what drives this community, and that's the people. You want to have as many cool, fun people as possible in this place, doing cool and fun and free things. And it's gonna be a place in Sarasota County that everybody's gonna wanna go to, because the bulk of this cultural district is gonna be cool and fun with a lot of people. And the minuscule part that remains for developers to make money on is going to be so desirable that they will do what they can to be part of this development because it's going to be the coolest, funnest place to be in in Sarasota County. Great. proportion of uh, open space to constructions and to stick to that. The question is, can you make decisions about the proportion of open space to building and stick to it? Um, it's a really interesting question because Tom was asking me before about examples of when this works and how it's worked and why have principles. And I return again to Brooklyn. Um, once you've arrived at a vision and you've started working with a designer and you have some serious numbers to really talk about economic trade-offs, then I think the answer is yes. Before then, I think you're, um, you may be tying your hands in ways that you don't want to. But we did that in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn Bridge Park, we had the fierce conversation about if real estate is going to pay for this, what kind of real estate, how can we minimize the amount of real estate, what does that do to view planes, because if we minimize the footprint, we're going to have to go high, otherwise we've got ugly squatty buildings that take up. We had that fight. We talked a lot about design, we talked a lot about real estate economics as a community, and we ended up saying that never, ever, 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 will more than 20% of the footprint of what is now Brooklyn Bridge Park be consumed with buildings to support the park. And in fact, the final master plan in the current real estate market in New York, which is pretty hot, um, projects that build out of Brooklyn Bridge Park will be accomplished at 11% of the footprint, so we're way under the rule we set for ourselves. And we, we made that rule, we stuck to it. It's in all the regulations for how the park is gonna be built out and administered. But it was informed by work with a designer and an understanding of real estate economics that the whole community engaged in um, that I hope you will. And I think the answer is yes, but not now. Yes. Uh, yes, although we're gonna get to, well, the, the, the comment was, but you might want it to be restrictive, and there may be value to restricting um, in advance. And I would say, yes, that's true, but then you're going to have to engage in a conversation about how this gets paid for. And if everything is free, so you're not going to have any earned income, and you're not going to have any development, you start to limit the possibilities of paying for something great. But that's a conversation you need to start having. And I think we should move somewhere over here uh, in the blue shirt. Yeah, I, uh, I'm listening to we want to have food, we want to have you know, drinks and things of that nature. 
I think if this is going to have a long-term life, we want to minimize bricks and, bricks and mortar and have the ability, I, I, you go to the great parks around the world and they have stands, they have very, very informal ways of changing foods because of changing taste, because of changing ethnic uh, desires. So not a lot of bricks and mortars because bricks and mortars are hard to change. They become legacies in and of themselves, but something that allows much more fluidity in serving the changing needs of the public over many, many years. The, I think most of you heard most of that. The, the only comment, and I, I'm not expressing an opinion, I'm just a, a response, to something to think about, um, and something that, that we've been talking about is it is true that most of the great parks of the world do not have a lot of built structures in them. The question is, is this a park in which there are some cultural institutions, or is this a cultural campus to which we have added a fabulous bayfront access and park? And, and they're different, different, different things, I think. Um, let's move to the next. So we're gonna talk about connectivity, um, which was hard to write because people had a lot to say about it. So frankly, I think our principle's too long. Um, but right now it talks about improved connectivity between the Bayfront adjacent neighborhoods and the wider region, and the fact that the site is now isolated um, limits its ability to achieve its aspirations, that connectivity should be accomplished via safe, convenient pedestrian, bicycle, water transit connections, north, south, east, across the bay, but people are gonna continue to drive. So we also have to have convenient automobile access to the site, but it should be accommodated in the smallest practicable footprint, is the way um, Alex and I reacted to what we heard when we were last here. And so, um, to start the conversation, which I think, I'm not sure you, that you need these prompts, um, this business about restricting automobile access, do you perceive a tension between the legitimate desire to restrict automobile access and restrict the footprint of surface parking and access for all. I mean, many people have, cars are going to be their primary means of access. Is there a tension between the desire to restrict access to automobiles and sustaining cultural institutions that bring their customers to their facility in cars? Um, if you agree that there's some tension, uh, how would you resolve it? To what extent can this be solved offsite? And then the second question that I think is interesting is that investment in infrastructure is likely to be some of the most expensive investment that you will make in order to achieve the vision. So if we assume that that investment occurs over some period of time, which transportation investments would you prioritize? Is north-south bicycle the most important? Is east to downtown uh, pro probably primarily bicycle and automotive? or is building the water taxi network that some of you have expressed interest in the first move you would make? Uh, way in the back, in the sweater vest. Um, I think most of the great parts of it, a lot of us have visited, and have been brought up, brought up by, um, Connectivity is really not an issue, it's not a thought. Because those places, have built in infrastructures which allow people to get very easily from one place to another. Sarasota, unfortunately, has none of that. And if you think about this in terms of a master plan, then you have to consider the fact that the east end of Main Street and the government center, uh, the west end of Main Street with Five Points and Lower Main, the, the, the uh, Bayfront Park and around Marina Jackson, O'Leary's, uh, the area north of Fruitville, Burns Court, are all individual isolated nodes. This adds another individual isolated node to that mix. There's a lot of potential for enjoying those nodes, but there's no way to get from one to the other. You enjoy one, and then you, with some difficulty, go to another or on another day. Uh, what we have to think about is, in terms of a master plan, is the connectivity of all of these nodes together in a way that allows people to move between and among them in a way that allows each to develop its own distinctive characteristic and its own distinctive attractions and give most accessibility for most people uh, in, in whatever happens. So, you know, maybe this becomes the festival space. Let's, maybe this becomes a cultural campus with a park attached. 
but it's going to be fundamentally <coughs> different from what's occurring north of Fruitville or what's occurring in Burns Court or what's occurring in downtown Sarasota on, on Five Points in the area. And I think you have to think about connectivity within the context of downtown Sarasota as a whole. If you simply focus on connectivity in this particular space, and, and I think it's a great idea to develop, but if you think about connectivity in this particular space, what you're simply doing is creating yet another isolated space within an area that has tremendous potential for integration, and, and you're, you're, losing, you're losing a great chance. White shirt. Yes, sir. I've been to a lot of other cities. Uh, Melbourne is good. It has a free tram that goes around the downtown. Portland, Oregon has a free train tram that goes around the city. Uh, what about the possibility? Thank you. Of taking all of the uh, all of the uh, parking spaces out of the downtown, having a, uh, free buses that move throughout the community through a set route stopping at key places in the community. The downtown area, all of the key uh, places we want to, want to go, the parks, uh, you say, okay, that's gonna cost money. Everything we do is going to cost money. Or maybe you just charge everybody a buck to get on the bus, a buck for a bus ride. And they get on, they go over, they wanna go, they get on the bus again, you charge them a dollar for it if you have to have some money to defray your cost. But we talked about Duani and his uh, proposition uh, many years ago about uh, reaching the Bayfront. How do we get people across 41, this type of thing? We could set up a, a series of routes where these buses, buses move constantly throughout the community to all of these key points and deliver people to all of these places, whether it's Marina Jacks, Selby, the downtown area, uh, the Bayfront, uh, the Van Wazel, and put the parking lots on the extremities and just move people around. So if people need to park, they're gonna have to come in from the outside. I live in a CS to Key, so I have to drive into town. You get them used to parking in parking lots with buses constantly moving them around. You talk about the handicap situation. Handicapped people can be accommodated on these buses and you can have the proper shelters in all these locations so that you can move people efficiently without a great deal of problem. Yes. Uh, no matter what um, transportation system is set up, the most obvious need uh, for connectivity is a bridge between downtown, the proximity of downtown to this fabulous site and to the Bayfront dictates that we have a bridge that spans 41. Simple the easiest and best solution, and it's incredible it hasn't been done yet, at least to the Bayfront, uh, to Bayfront Park. The comment was, if you're gonna solve connectivity to downtown, there has to be a bridge. I'm gonna take this gentleman over here, and then we're gonna move to the last principle. Thank you. Just, just as you're thinking about this, I mean, another way of thinking about this, I'm kind of inspired by some of the trams that I've seen in Europe and realize that's just way too expensive for us to do. I'm also inspired by I've seen the parking situation downtown and know what happens when you take parking spaces away. Good luck with all this. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are thinking about how do we solve the transportation challenges of the future? How do we solve the transportation challenges of older populations? which is something here in Sarasota, Sarasota we've talked about, should we be a model or a, or a do tank for you know, what are the tomorrow solutions? And maybe one way of, of strategizing around this is to say, how could we get some big companies who are thinking about what's the transportation of the future to work with us to figure it out here in Sarasota and address a number of these issues that I agree with around, around the islands and moving populations that are becoming less mobile and more reliant on automobiles rather than less. Okay, we're gonna conclude with a conversation about sustainability, um, by which we mean both resilience, ecological sustainability, um, financial sustainability of the, um, the cultural institutions and whatever else ends up being here, and economic sustainability vis-a-vis -vis the city of Sarasota. This has to be a net positive for the city of Sarasota. So 
there is certainly much that we could talk about there. Uh, the last time we were here, as I mentioned, a number of people suggested that this is really the gatekeeper principle, that you have to achieve ecological, economic, and financial sustainability, or the rest of it doesn't matter. Do you agree? Um, second, uh, I don't propose that you actually parse this big, long question, but let me propose a hypothetical, because this has come up several times. To build the kind of great concert hall that the two major cultural or organizations that are here now need and deserve, and that the young woman in the back suggested will keep retain young people here and attract the kind of acts that you deserve, it's a, it's a big, tall thing. And if we're going to build it elevated so that it is a resilient structure and try and tuck some parking underneath it so that we don't have surface parking so that we can create more parkland, um, we may run into the view corridors. How do you start to think about balancing all of those? Now, I'm not showing you a picture, so at some level, you're gonna say, Candace, I can't sensibly answer that, but I'm curious like, what your first reaction is. Is your first reaction, I'd need to see the numbers? Is your first reaction, we have to figure out a way to get that concert hall? Or is your first reaction, you're in the view corridor, end of conversation, or something else? That's the second question. Third question, and we're not going to settle all these tonight, but they are the kinds of questions that, that you need to start talking about. Great open space with cultural institutions in it. Great open space, cultural institutions t increasingly look to a mix of funding sources for both capital and operating. They're looking to public funds, tax dollars, and bonding. They look to earned income, restaurants and bars and parking garages that they can make money with. They look to philanthropy and they look to capturing the value of what they create. So if we create a great cultural campus with a great park, it's gonna make the adjacent retail more valuable. Should some portion of that net value be channeled into maintaining and building the park, for instance, by renewing the CRA? Um, do those resonate? Does that make sense? Should we be looking at those sources of funds or are there some of those that you think are off the table? The beginning of a conversation that we're certainly not going to finish tonight. Let's get some first reactions. Yes. Thank you. Um, this, this actually, the points that I wanted to, the comments that I wanted to make, come back to the last time I was at the Bayfront 2020, which regards the fact that we're talking a lot about the 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 area of the, the parking lot, et cetera, around, around the, the Van Weasel. Uh, when we look at the quay, and thankfully we have a picture here of the quay, just to the right of the quay, everybody can see a dark line going north to south, actually that's going east to west. That is a public right of way. And my husband and I are the owners of three acres of privately owned submerged lands directly in front of that. I'm bringing this up now because you know everybody's very interested in water taxis and using the waterfront, et cetera. Uh, I want the public to be aware, and maybe you know this should be part of the dialogue, that that area is not at all used, and everybody's kind of waiting for the quay to be built, and that's private, that's private land, so they're no doubt going to be wanting to use every square foot of that. So the only public lands available in that area is that 50-foot right of way going towards the water. What I'd love to see is some access to the bay there, some way that people could be using it from, you know, the actual waterfront access. And that area is also a, pr a protected area. People saying, oh, well, we should be to build a marina down by, by Van Weasel. That's not really viable because it's open to the, fr to the, air to the, to the outside water. But, it would be viable to, to use the area in front of all these condominiums that are kind of using that water for themselves. Yes, ma'am. I'll repeat it. The comment was renew the CRA, and that, that's gonna be critical for pulling this off. It's the um, it's, it's community, community, Re redevelopment. Re community Redevelopment Act, which um, allows you to, uh, it's, it's like tax increment financing in other jurisdictions. Uh, every jurisdiction calls it something different, but allows you to channel the increase in taxes to pay the capital costs of a particular new investment. 
Um, it's used to create baseball stadiums and build cultural facilities and parks and parking garages across uh, the country. Um, your ability to do that is up for renewal. Did everybody hear? She said, um, finan achieving financial sustainability is about very creative stacking of multiple sources of small funds that we're going to have to um, collect money from the public, think about ticketing, think about paid trolley, uh, connecting downtown and the value downtown gets from the waterfront to this site that it's going to be lots and lots of little sources that get stacked together because we can't count on public funds. Yes? I think a perfect example of number three, I just came from the Perez Museum in Miami at the Bayfront, how they dealt with the space, with a parking issue, with parts for people to enjoy. I mean, it was just astounding. And I think everybody should take a good look at that. The comment was everybody should go see the great museum and uh, the symphony hall and park in Miami, which is a great example of how you can combine open space and cultural, and they figured out a sustainable operating model. It's also by a great landscape designer. Uh, one last question, and then I'm gonna let Tom wrap up. Yes. References to uh, sustainability, climate change, storm surges, the depth of the of the land, the water table, etc. Would you please ex uh, tell us if you've done anything along those lines? The question was: Has anybody done any environmental condition assessment or looked at projections of how climate change is likely to affect the site? Um, there are FEMA maps. There are new FEMA maps for pretty much the entire coastline. Um, I'm not familiar with them. I would hardly know what I was looking at if I looked at a FEMA map, but they exist, and there are credible projections of how climate change under various storm conditions and um, ocean level rise predictions is likely to affect the site. The site's likely to be significantly affected. Um, I don't believe there are environmental condition studies, but I could be wrong. Um, Presumably that would be done as part of a subsequent design process. Um, it's certainly something that a master planning team would want to think hard about and look more into. All right. Yeah. All you would need to know, ma'am, is to con see John O. Raise your hand oh, there. Very good. John O. Miller. All you need to do is go talk to John O. Miller and he'll set you straight on the environmental conditions uh, as well as anybody. So, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your input. Um, let's just wrap this up because we did say we would, we would get everybody out by seven. So, Michael, what's next? We're going to continue to collect data and input. I mean, I'm so inspired what I heard tonight from all of you. I mean, this is incredible. And this whole process that we're involved in right now, I think, is amazing for me because I've never seen that as long as I've been in, in Sarasota. Um, I think what's going to happen is we're going to continue to develop this data and all of this input and try to finalize these, um, these key ingredients to crystallize all of those into something that we can all get behind and use as that guidepost going forward. Okay, and the deal with the city commission calls for you to go back to the city commission in, by? In January. In and, January. And we're having a workshop with them where we hope to present all of the findings that we've heard from across the community and we'll continue to hear, I'm sure. Okay, so you'll be able to find out about when that occurs on the Bayfront 2020 on the uh, website, Facebook, on the Facebook page, on the Twitter feed. The Herald Tribune will report that. I can't 
we will, we will report that, I'm sure. Um, so thank you for your patience, everybody. I want to uh, call out uh, Charles Klapstadtle of METV. Uh, they agreed at the last minute to come video this. Um, they will post it on METVweb.com on, on the YouTube channel, right? I got it right? Um, so it'll be on there by tonight or tomorrow morning at the latest. Um, thanks again to the Van Wazel. Um, uh, the, uh, we, it's a busy place, and thank you for having us. Thank you to everybody uh, for coming. Have a good night. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.